Sonoma Brain Trust. We're back at you this week for this week's episode. This week, we've got Anthony Veluza with us. He's going to be talking with us a little bit about what it means to be a fiduciary. So we titled the session, What the Fiduciary? So when you meet professionals out there, uh, some of them go by and use uh, what they call the fiduciary rules. And that means that they're willing to act in your best interest um, as a professional. Believe it or not, that's not the case with all professionals. So we want to take some time here today to talk a little bit about what fiduciary means and why it's important to you when you're talking to professionals in the community to get advice and assistance. So Anthony, before we get diving into that, tell us a little bit about your law practice. Tell us about how long you've been in town and, and what type of law you focus on. Sure. Uh, I am a partner at uh, Hauser Veluzzo and Piasta. Uh, I am married to Mary Piasta, I think uh, one of your cohorts. And uh, we've been in town for, uh, boy, about 10 years. Uh, we moved up from Oakland um, and uh, when we started having kids and needed a, kind of a, a, a larger, more relaxed place for the children. Um, my Practice primarily includes uh, estate planning, trust administration, probate. Uh, I do uh, some family business uh, work as well. Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, succession planning in that sense, multiple generation businesses. And uh, I do uh, trust and estates litigation as well. Great. So when I say that, that phrase fiduciary, what does fiduciary mean from a legalistic standpoint? Uh, a fiduciary is somebody that has a legal duty to someone else. And a fiduciary, the term can be used for either that relationship and that duty, or uh, it can be used as a short term for a professional fiduciary. And a professional fiduciary is someone who uh, essentially is a, a professional trustee or professional uh, executor, someone who can be trusted and is, uh, has taken a test is fully licensed to administer someone's estate or trust. Well, so I think it goes without asking, but why would having someone act as a fiduciary to you be even important to consider? The, it's important for, I think, a couple of reasons. The fiduciary has no skin in the game. Uh, they, they don't have any reason to prefer one beneficiary over another, or uh, an ex-spouse, or, or a current spouse versus uh, children from previous spouse, they're completely neutral. All they do is take the document, whether it's a will or a trust, and uh, carry out administration of it to the closest extent of what those wishes are in that document as possible. Um, that's one of the benefits. The second benefit, and I think this is probably the biggest, is that they have done this before. If there's a house that needs to be sold, uh, you know, just like Chelsea uh, has tons of experience selling houses out of uh, probate, you know, uh, a fiduciary who is selling a house out of a probate is gonna know exactly what to look for. They're gonna be able to um, tell individuals, you know, this is what it might appraise at, but, uh, you know, we, we can get around that if need be. Uh, or the appraisal is wrong, they can they can always uh, challenge, uh, say, a probate referee who who does a quick drive-by of a house and says it's worth X amount, and they say no, no, it's not worth that much. Um, so, and, and they really the, the important part about that too is that they can actually save money in the long run. Um, attorneys, everybody thinks when somebody dies, you got to talk to an attorney and. For probate, since you're filing something, yes, you need to talk to an attorney. Uh, for uh, trust administration, it's also helpful. But if you have somebody like a fiduciary in that trustee position, in that executor position, they're going to be able to navigate things a lot more uh, succinctly, a lot uh, better than an average person, and um, not cost as much as an attorney. I think uh, we were talking before that a lot of the attorneys in town um, or, or maybe two, three times what a, a professional fiduciary is. Um, and, th you know, they, they are great because they keep you out of some of the 
hiccups that you can find yourself in for no other reason than the people, the personalities that you're dealing with. Um, so it, to me, in the long run, they're a huge benefit unless you have somebody that is really good at um, kind of keeping everybody happy or, or everyone can just trust uh, like, you know, they're, they're the actual person who passed. So I think it's important to kind of delineate this, pull that word apart for a minute, right? Because you've got this word fiduciary and the context in which you're talking about, Tony, is there's a fiduciary that operates that can op operate and help execute estate documents, right? So someone who could stand in as more or less the successor trustee in a trust situation, and then you've got a fiduciary where you could find like in my profession where you have financial advisors, that advisors actually say, hey, we're going to take a fiduciary obligation to you. I mean, we're going to only advise you in your best interest. Shocker, not everybody does that, right? So like you would think when you go to a financial advisor that that advice you're going to is only going to give you best interest advice. That's not always the case. Now, they just passed a law being July 1st today called Reg BI, which changes that and sort of kind of gray-like, you know, kind of how Wall Street does it, forces brokers to also be fiduciary. So brokers are traditionally advisors you'd find at any of the big firms you might think of. And if financial advisors that are fiduciaries or advisors, you might find at what's called a registered investment advisor. It's important to know the difference. It's important to know what the incentive alignment, because I think that's... Tony, your real point is like you, when you want that third person, that third group executing the estate docs, you want them operating as a fiduciary to you, that they're acting in your best interest. That's really important. And Chelsea, in real estate, the same is true, right? There's a fiduciary obligation that you take with your clients. Is that correct? Yeah. So I owe all my clients a fiduciary duty to do what's in their best interest. And one of the best examples I could give is we have a house on the market and we get an offer that's below asking. And to me, maybe it's offensive or maybe it's just ridiculously low, but I owe my clients a fiduciary duty to bring them any and all offers to give them the option to accept or reject that offer. So I've heard stories where some realtors are like, I'm not even going to take that to my client. It's so offensive. It's so low. I'm not going to even entertain this with them. But in reality, it is our duty to bring them any type of offer they get because it's ultimately up to them to make the decision and they're going to make the decision that's best for them. So even if it's an offer that's lower than what they were wanting, maybe the terms meet exactly what they need. Maybe it's a quicker escrow and they need to sell the, the house faster than what they originally planned. Um, you know, just you have to always do what's in the best interest of your clients. And I think one thing that people maybe don't understand is ethically for the most part, I think everyone wants to do the right thing, right? We all want to do ethically what's best, but in the world of fiduciary duty, they don't necessarily go hand in hand, I think. And I learned that outside of real estate when I got my license, I was, told and it was pounded into me that you owe your client a fiduciary duty. I read the book, um, money master the game by Tony Robbins. And in that book, he brought up how brokers don't always owe a fiduciary duty to their clients when clients are making investments with their monies. And some brokers, um, they advise you to buy certain stocks or bonds or whatever, because maybe they have a contract with this company to sell as many stocks or bonds or whatever the, the item is. And ethically, it's wrong, right, to advise your client to do something that's probably not in their best interest. But at the same time, they don't have that fiduciary duty that holds them to that standard of doing what's in the best interest of their clients. Does that make sense? Did I just totally. And it, it brings up so it's one thing that we see a lot in our world. And, and one of the things you're talking about, Chelsea, is termed as revenue sharing. So let's say, for example, you walk into broker X's office, that broker, their firm is going to get compensated to recommend different solutions differently, as will they in some ways. And that's that conflict of interest you're talking about. 
And literally until July 1st, 2020, that was not mandatory that that advisor operate in the best interest of the client unless that advisor took the extra step to become a registered investment advisor and adhere to that fiduciary commitment uh, to their clients. So what happened, if anyone out there wants to see what this is all about, just go ahead and type in revenue sharing in any Google search engine, put in a name of a big firm you might have your assets with, and voila, a PDF will show up and you can see just how much literally has been paid to these organizations to quote unquote, be on the platform and to be an investment solution, right? That's that conflict of interest that's there that really hasn't been dealt with in any kind of, I think, transparent way in the industry. And the, at least the investment industry has continued to allow that to happen because it's very profitable for a lot of these firms. Some firms, it's a third of their revenue, right? So easy. You pay these people to help you make these best investments for your future, for your family's financial future, and they have ulterior motives in advising you to go to go a certain way. And I think for like the legal world, and Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, we all see the worst in people when someone dies, right? We've all we've all experienced that in our business. People, when money's involved and there's a death, people just they lose themselves. And in, when a family member dies and you have maybe three children and one brother is the successor trustee or the executor or administrator of the estate and he just, he hates his youngest sister, how do you make him make the best decisions possible for the estate and the benefit of all the beneficiaries if he just can't, he just despises his youngest sister but if you have a professional fiduciary whose entire job and obligation is to do what's the best for the overall estate and the benefit of all the beneficiaries equally, right? Like that's what a fiduciary in the legal world is meant to do. They right. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because a, a good portion of what I do is either defending or initiating uh, a petition to remove a trustee who's also a beneficiary, who's also a child of the decedent, and uh, insert a private fiduciary, a professional fiduciary. And if things don't turn around, uh, whether, you, you know, for that trustee or that executor, if things don't turn around with what they do, uh, and that's what they're going to face. And um, a lot of the time, it's, it's a good thing. You know, uh, what's really interesting is that the courts would much rather have somebody like a professional fiduciary involved because of that licensing requirement, because of their, uh, their emotional distance from all of the issues that are causing problems, and just going through and saying, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that, let's get it going, and then we're done. Um, so, you know, that, I mean... You can always remove a trustee that's a beneficiary and replace them with another beneficiary. But uh, if you really want the court to sign off on it and you really want to look good and you really want things to go well, uh, you throw a, f a professional fiduciary in there. Um, it's just, it, it's one of those things. And then, of course, you have to step back and say, well, if we had done this at the beginning, we would have saved ourselves, uh, you know, court fees, uh, filing fees, uh, attorney's fees and all the like, and you'd be further down the road to administering what you need to administer. How do you advise people when they come to see you if they should um, put in a private fiduciary as their successor trustees? Is there a way you go about advising it? Uh, how do they make that decision? Um, we usually talk about their family. Uh, I think most people over a certain age who have adult children, think it's a good idea to give it to one of their, give that role to one of their kids. Um, and so we talk about what kind of training that person has if they're, um, you know, if they're good with numbers or if they are the type of person that uh, hasn't paid taxes in the last four years. Um, that's, that's a really important aspect of it. And then we talk about the relationship that child may have with the other beneficiaries. 
And if anything that the uh, individual is doing in their estate planning documents is going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, if they can say no to all that, then uh, and, and then the person that they're working with is, you know, uh, reasonably educated and at least knows that they're going to have to get an attorney involved uh, just to guide them, then they can do their own thing. But I will suggest a professional fiduciary if their children, uh, for example, uh, a number of them have drug problems, uh, there needs to be anything that will uh, has to be taken account of and, and a firm hand used uh upon the client's death um, or if there's somebody uh, that is going to receive money, a beneficiary that has uh, special needs or needs to be taken care of in a special way. You know, obviously with special needs trust, I say that and um, a lot of people don't understand what, what that really is and what that means. Uh, and if you don't, and if you administer the trust in a certain way without regards to that, you can of course forfeit that, beneficiaries public assistance uh, which is never a good thing um, so it, it, basically any complexity uh, you know occasionally I'll get the, the single person who has one child they were an only child and uh, everything's pretty much cut and dry um, and I'll just kind of sit back and go okay well don't worry about the professional fiduciary because uh, even if everything worse comes to worse it's all going to go to one person but uh, anything else, uh, it's always an option to throw out there uh, and, and purely educate people half the time as well. They don't, you know, like Darren started off with, they don't always understand what a professional fiduciary is. They think it's just somebody off the street that you pay that's, you know, knows how to do this faster or something. And it's really important that they understand what that role brings to the table, what that profession brings to the table uh, so they can make better choices about their own estate plan. You know, so just so everybody's really clear, once you write, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, but, you know, if you go to the attorney and you get estate documents, you're going to usually, if it's a trust, you're going to have a successor trustee on there. That successor trustee typically is deferred to like a child or a friend or someone like that. And what you're saying, Tony, is that someone could go pick a private fiduciary that's licensed, that's bonded to do that job for them. And I can say just as a financial professional, it's nice when private fiduciaries are on accounts like that because it's much easier to just process the estate and deal with it because they know how that pattern goes. Do you find a similar outcome, Chelsea, in real estate? I I love all my clients for the most part, but I do find working with professional fiduciaries to be much easier because like Tony said, they're distanced emotionally and all they come in to do is they just want, they want to do their job. They want to do what's best for the estate and the beneficiaries and that emotion just, it's not there. They're numbers and processes and let's do what's best and let's go. And I find that they're just much easier to work with, especially in real estate because buying or selling real estate is already very emotional. It's a large lump sum lump sum of money people get emotional with that but then when you're selling mom and dad's home after they lived in it for 50 years and they've passed away that's often one of the last things you're getting rid of that's theirs and clients really really have a hard time with dealing with that it's it's um very much a roller coaster of up and down throughout the entire process so to have a professional fiduciary come in and take over that role and just be able to sell that property and get it done with it's like night and day in terms of being easier totally yeah it's, so i think it's just important that you know you have choices and uh we're, we'll leave it there today and tony thanks for taking the time i know your family's headed out on vacation and I, I'm sure you guys are rounding up the troops and there's a lot going on. So thank you. Uh, we just want people to know they have a choice when it comes to working with a professional. Uh, you can, there are people out there who will take a best interest oath to you to do and to work in your best interest. And that's really an important, whether it's dealing with attorneys or private fiduciaries, dealing with real estate agents or dealing with financial advisors. Anyway, that's all for the Snowball Brain Trust for this week. I hope everyone stays well and is safe. And we'll talk soon. Happy 4th of July, you guys. Happy 4th of July. <laughs>